Welcome to Fort Worth 148's podcast, where we meet to discuss Masonic topics and strive to build value in the Brotherhood. The opinions and statements of the participants do not represent any positions or stance of any Grand Lodge or Lodge, and are solely the viewpoints of the participants. Welcome back to the podcast, brothers. This is Rip Moore, past master and current secretary of Fort Worth 148. This is Billy Hamilton, senior steward for 148. And this is Gabriel Yagish, master mason with Fort Worth 148. All righty, boys. How are y'all doing? Doing good. Doing good. Maybe frustrated with yep. technology, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've been... Ironing out technology for the last what fifty two minutes? Shh, 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 shh. No, please don't make don't make me think about that. <laughs> so, but we're here, we're ready to go. Although we had some good discussion while you were starting to restart in Discord. I, I know. Think See, we're that's, kinda... there's the silver lining. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Kind of ironing out our new Lodge app that we're developing. Mm, that's kind of fun. Tell us about yep. this. Tell us about the idea. Um. So we. At our lodge, we have a lot of guys that come in off the internet that nobody nobody knows from Adam. Uh, so we have kind of a process set up that usually takes them six to eight months to get a petition. And we want to start collecting data on basically every time they're there, their visit there, what they thought of it, what we thought of it, uh, to better guard our West Gate. So, you know, essentially the app would have some kind of way for the person to check in, say, hey, I was here at lodge you know, a night earning my petition. And he would have to talk to a a master Mason that would verify that for him. Hey, I'm checking in on the app. Can you verify that I was here? And he would oblige and log in his side and say, yep, so-and-so was here tonight. We had a good discussion about whatever. So when they actually become a brother, we've got a good idea of what they're inclined to lean towards, you know, when it comes to those quadrants, are they love charity? Do they love philosophical discussion? Do they seem to be a ritualist? So we can kind of encourage those things he leans towards, you know, just another way to get to gather data, basically. That's pretty cool. I like it. It's it's dragging masonry into the 21st century. (laughs) You got it. And, you know, it'll eventually get much more in depth because we have a mentoring program we call Big Brother that has checklists that will load into the app that they can log in and say, hey, I've done the monitor work. I've done the visiting lodge, all the X, Y, Z's we have them to do before they progress to fellow craft master mason, in addition to their proficiency, of course. But this way, instead of it being a paper form that a big brother has to check off, the the entered apprentice or fellow craft would go in and actually say, hey, I did that. And then it would get verified by his big brother through a conversation, whatever it may be. I think that's really cool. In a way, it would be even more fair on both sides, right? So the lodge knows exactly, you know, they they have a, a good way to account for everybody who shows up, right, which is great. Uh, but for the potential candidate, right? I mean, they don't have to depend on one or two people who they happen to know to actually be there uh, to account for them there. So exactly. If, if I'm talking to one guy and he's not there the next time I show up, it doesn't look like, you know, I've only come by one time. You know, you get proper credit. Exactly. And then that way we know exactly how many times he showed up, what works best. We can start analyzing this data over so much time to tweak this process, you know, cause it'll have our mentoring, it'll have the candidate intro. And then of course we'll add in the additional things we do for investigation processes to log that in there that only the investigating team can see, you know, like, Hey, who Googled his phone number? Who Googled his name? What's his Facebook page look like? And all that would be reported into the app and would have to be completed before a full investigation would be considered done. Just kind of help remind those things that are important to know about a candidate, you know. But it it should actually uh, kind of streamline the whole process. So I recommend all lodges looking into it. That sounds pretty awesome. Uh, it sounds very cool. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. I mean, that's 
every launch has got to have a web page, absolutely. But web pages are kind of a thing of the past. You know, it's like the telephone now, you know, it's going because everything's going to these smartphones. And if it's not smartphone compatible, it'll kind of dead in the water. Yeah, I, and for, you know, not everybody actually goes to the web. I mean, a lot of people, most of their online interaction is going to be through social media, but it's not always the same social media, right? Some people use Facebook. Some people use Twitter. I was talking to one Demolay chapter that most of their new candidates that come in uh, actually come in from Snapchat. Which was, uh, wait, what? I never would have thought about that. Well, that's oh, the wow, thing of the youngster. Awesome. My son only does Snapchat. He doesn't care about anything but Snapchat. You know, he's 12. Right. But that's kind of Demolay age. That's the new thing. They're, Facebook, that's what my grandpa's on. <laughs> I mean, but, right. you know, yeah, the, actually, yes, that is what a lot of our older relatives are on. So <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it's weird to think about that, too, right? That Facebook is, is really more for the older generation now. Yeah, it is. It's, it's kind of strange. And I mean, like, it took me ages to get used to the idea of using Instagram regularly. And I still don't think of it as like a social network type thing. Like, I look at it as like, I post photos here and look at other people's photos and like, maybe eventually sometimes comment on it. But there's people that use things like Instagram and Snapchat as like their full time social media, which I don't know if I'm just out of touch. But man, like, it makes me feel weird. <laughs> I'm just kind of like, well, what's I going mean, that's... on here? that's the nature of things today because you know it used to be generational huge gaps in between changes you know cassette tapes were around until i was 18 or 19 you know huge span from dude i'm a generation behind you and i was still using cassette tapes so it's it's, it's, yeah but we went from cd to mp3 in almost a flash you know cds were around for a while but technology now is advancing so fast to where Masonry has a real challenge ahead staying abreast of that because I know we don't do Snapchat at our lodge. No, but uh, we totally and we should. should. Yes. Yeah. Um, because it, it needs to be broadcasted out there and it's cheap and easy. But, you know, in the end, you've got to have a, a brother that knows how to do it and enjoys doing it because Facebook, I can keep up with that all day. Uh, but, adding another social media in there, learning Snapchat. It's like, I'm too old for that. I should be young whippersnappers. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of what inspired the app is that we need to get up with the times because that way somebody comes up there and you, Gabe and Billy are the only ones there. All of us will know when you log your interaction with those candidates, how that went. And we'll see the good stuff and we'll see the bad stuff. And if there's something we need to be concerned with that you are, you can communicate it to everybody in the lodge just by logging it on the app and say, hey, you know, this guy said something really weird. I yeah, need that'd to- be a, a great way to discreetly uh, send up a red flag. Exactly. Yeah. Cause- Either that or we just share it with each other and go, hoo, 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 guess what this guy did? <laughs> <laughs> You got it. I mean, because it's uh, that's the thing is that peace and harmony has got to prevail in our lodge. And if you start bringing in guys just to bring them in and somebody has an issue with them, that's not a good thing. You know, because once those guys are in, there's it's like pulling teeth. It is hard to get them. So vet them on the front end. You know, this is a lifelong journey. So so what if they have to wait? over half a year to get initiated from the time they ask who cares it's a lifelong journey all right do a little work up front to prevent a massive headache later yeah and what really dawned on me after the fact is that that is kind of a essential part of the hero's quest you know the anticipation leading up to the quest and we're kind of robbing our new candidates of that moment to, you know, really create some value and realize that, Hey, I'm embarking on something pretty, pretty awesome here, you know, and speeding it up kind of cheapens and takes that away to where we need to really think about our process of bringing them in. But I digress. Tis the app. (laughs) Tis the app. 
let's talk about some uh, discussion questions. Um, so one question that I saw recently on Reddit was, what are your favorite Masonic blogs? Not not podcasts, blogs. What? Those things are still around? Oh, here we go. It's that... It's that generational thing. I don't know. I thought I thought uh, blogs were still valid. Are they not? <laughs> they, I, they absolutely are. And my thing is, is I've had my nose in Grand Lodge proceedings. That's a, really all I've been reading in the last year. Oh yeah, you... I can't think of the last blog or you know because I I used to read the Midnight Freemason somewhat regularly. Yep, mm-hmm. was regular as it was. Um, but I know the winding stairs has a blog too. That's pretty on point that I read snippets of it on Facebook every once in a while, which is a podcast as well, but yeah, well, it, it has blog. that like dual aspect, I guess. I don't know. What's that? He used to be a host of the Masonic round table, Nick Johnson. He I runs, think it's Nick uh, Johnson. The, yeah, his blog is Millennial Freemason, and it's actually yeah. one of, it's actually one of the ones I was going to recommend because yes. he lives a fascinating lifestyle. So, dude, that guy walks the razor edge. I love. I mean, I've heard many TMR uh, Masonic Roundtable podcasts go way down, you know, down the rabbit hole of his blog posts because they're real edgy. And I love the way he gets the discussion started by being so edgy. Yeah, and it it's very good and positive. And uh, Nick is it, he, you know, as, as somebody who is very passionate about the York Rite, it's all, always fun to hear his adventures because he's very deep in the York Rite rabbit hole. So that's always kind of fun. Bill, Billy, you got any? Uh, well, you you covered the the Midnight Freemason and the. Uh... Um, and then, of course, brother Chris Hodap uh, is always a wealth of information. Uh, yeah, he's a good one. Yeah, uh, one of the and so you know, kind of looking. It's not quite a blog, but um, I've been following Freemason Lifestyle on Instagram, and it turns out, oh, he does have a blog, FreemasonLifestyle dot com. So um, he has a lot of interesting posts, and usually he he posts longer descriptions with the posts. So. Uh, it's this guy called uh, Brian Godwin, and uh, so his website is freemasonlifestyle.com, dot com, and he posts a lot of interesting stuff. And so he and I, I've actually had the opportunity to talk with him a little bit, and he goes on a lot of cool adventures. So that's always kind of fun. That sounds like a good podcast guest. Mm-hmm. Um, another one that I've heard is, um, uh, or that not that I've heard that I've read is also uh, Tetrahedral Mason. And so it's uh, tetrahedralmason.blogspot.com, and that's pretty good. And he's active on Reddit, too, I think. So, uh, Yeah, I don't think there's a shortage of Masonic blogs, you know, because those, those were pretty, very popular. And still kind of are, but I think we're transitioning into the podcast. Yeah. And uh, I've got one, too. Mine is texanmason.com, you know, but I haven't updated it since July. <laughs> So I was uploading our, our like podcast notes there and I just haven't been very good about updating. So, but, uh, I saw that nobody owned the domain name for texanmason.com and I was like, mm, I know. Snatch that up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, like the, the, the moment I saw that it was unoccupied, I said, I've got to have it. So it's mine. Our second question for the night is, um, what is Memphis Mizraim? Uh, and I don't, what? I, I don't know actually how you say that. I think it's Memphis Mizram or Memphis Mizraim. Oh, and yeah. it is a Masonic rite or a pseudo Masonic rite. Cause it's not legit or I guess, it, I mean, it exists. It's just super clandestine. Um, it's based off of the Scottish rite. So, but the cool thing is, you know how the Scottish Rite is like super cool because it has 32 degrees instead of three? Well, these dudes, Memphis Miserum, have 99 degrees. Ain't that cool? What? <laughs> yeah. So they're got uh, 99 you know, problems, but a degree ain't one. No kidding. <laughs> Right. So. And, you know, I was at a Scottish Rite function the other day, and uh, they mentioned that Scottish Rite function, or they were 
they mentioned that Scottish Rite recognizes no higher than the 33rd degree. And I was thinking that is, an, that is a weird statement to make. And then I started thinking about the right of Memphis, Mizraim, and I'm like, oh, yeah, there were like 99 of those. They were yeah. making it clear. And so, like, my understanding is that most people that joined Memphis, Mizraim were only eligible to get the 90th degree because 91 through 99 um, are chair degrees, essentially. And so um, one of them is for, like, the the grandmaster. One of them is for like the i guess the super grandmaster or whatever you know um so it, it's just one of those things you know we can find all sorts of crazy stuff uh but they originated in Italy and they were they were the um combination of two rites the rite of Memphis and the rite of Misraim and so uh, Misraim was around in the late 1700s. Uh, Memphis was started in the early 1800s, and in the late 1800s, they combined Memphis right and Misraim right uh, because they were both super Egyptian and like you know very highly influenced. And it's a lot more occultic than regular um, masonry is. So the ma- masonry itself doesn't really have a lot of occult elements. It has a lot of esoteric elements, but it's not really occultic and Memphis Misram is like super occultic and um their their full name is the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis Misram so um you know lodge the, their blue lodge degrees are are pretty similar you know they you can you know their apprentice companion master right and then they have the college which is Scottish rite degrees uh 4 through 14 They've got chapter, which is, uh, you know, Rose Croy, 15 through 18. They've got the Senate, which is uh, 19 through 29. I, that's analogous to the Council of Kadosh. They've got the Areopage and Tribunal, which is 30 through 33, which is equivalent to consistory. And then they've got consistory, which is like 34 on through 75. And then they've got the... Uh, Sublime Council, which is 76 through 90. And then they've got the Grand Tribunal, which is 91 through 99. And so, for example, um, some of the degrees are very <laughs> familiar to us. You know, we've got Secret Master and Prince of Jerusalem and Knight of the Rose Cross, uh, you know, Knight of Kadosh, Sovereign Grand Inspector General. But then we look at stuff like Sublime Negotiant, Prince of the Zodiac, Patriarch of the Sacred Vedas, uh, Intendant Regulator or Patriarch of Memphis, Sublime Sage or Knight of Nepf, and then the Grand Tribunal. Um, the ninetieth, de- oh, so the ninetieth degree ends with Sublime Master of the Great Work, and then you get to the Grand Tribunal, which is all like the Grand Master Chair degrees. So you've got Grand Defender, Grand Catechist, Cate- Regulator General, Prince of Prince of Memphis or Grand Administrator, Grand Conservator, Grand and Puissant Sur- Sovereign of the Order, Deputy International Grand Master, International Grand Master, and the 99th degree is the Grand Hierophant. And so the Grand Hierophant is the guy who's in charge of Memphis Misram over the entire world. So you've got like, I don't know what the difference between him and the International Grand Master is, but that's a thing. So, um, originally, um, the there were six sublime magi night of the 96th degree that were presided over by the grand hierophant of the 97th degree. Uh, but then they added two more degrees and then he became the 99th degree. So like they have, and they have jewels for each degree. Can you imagine <clears throat> keeping a closet filled with 99 jewels and 99 officers for every degree? That would be that's, amazing. That's a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so basically, like, Albert, like, and it's clandy, super clandy. It's and, good, right? and there, they are, there are chapters operating in the United States, so that's that's a thing. Like, there's, um, they're in France, Belgium, uh, the UK, uh, they're in most of continental Europe, uh, Canada, the US. They're apparently they're really big in South America. Uh, and then uh, there's a lot of them in Africa 
So, um, but basically it, it takes hold in places where masonry hasn't really established itself very well. And then they just like, yes, this is masonry. And nobody knows the difference because they're just like, oh yeah, like that makes sense. So it's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. That's something we need to have a podcast about is clandestine masonry. Yes. We'll have to... It is getting more and more popular by the minute. Yeah. Um... Uh, it it's a complicated long discussion so we'll have to talk about that later you got it putting the brakes on that <laughs> yes so rit what are we here to talk about tonight actually so we're finally to the episode content we're going to talk about the texas masonic apron cuz it's different than anywhere else you mean that plain white apron that looks so boring mm-hmm. just, that just old kidding. boring white apron i love my apron. <laughs> and and you know, leave it to Texas. I think it's, our apron is better than everybody else's. Well, it is the biggest, so at least we're in keeping with Texas tradition that things in Texas are always bigger, and right. hence our apron is sixteen by sixteen. Well, how so about that? That's what we're here to discuss tonight. Uh, of course, the white, the plain white apron. Why we wear it? How uh, it's incorporated in our ritual. And then, of course, what is permissible when it comes to decorating your apron or having emblems on it in Texas Freemasonry? Because they're pretty specific. I mean, it's not you can't just put whatever you want on it, which they used to do in the old days. Not no more. (laughs) So where do we want to start? We want to start at the very beginning. Let's start at the very beginning. Uh do you have any are we talking like the the history of the origin of the apron or yeah i think that's a good place to start because it's something that really and truly you don't hear talked about a lot in freemasonry is that we perform a lot of rites and one of them is the right of invest investiture investiture yeah. somebody say that for me right so i can i think it's investiture investiture there we go put the texas twang on it put a question mark at the end yeah. <laughs> and that's basically <laughs> investing someone with the badge of the profession. So the first mm-hmm. thing that comes to mind to me is that moment that you've been through the police academy, you've done all the tests, you've passed all the stuff, and you finally get the badge of a police officer. That's a pretty cool moment. That is uh, cool. Yeah, same thing in the military, your stripe, whatever it may be. But it's the same thing in our craft that when you're presented that apron that is presenting you with the badge of a mason making you an official brother and it's been something that's been done since before recorded history really i mean because jpl talks about it going back to uh, jpl jewel p lightfoot past grandmaster talks about it going back into antiquity through many cultures let me see. I've got notes here. So it was found in the mysteries of the Mithras. The candidate was invested with a white apron. In Hudistan, the initiate was invested with a cord. A Jewish sect of the essence clothed their, clothed their novices in white robes. The Japanese, let's see, Japanese practice certain rites, invested their candidates with a white apron and girdle. That's all out of Lightfoot's monitor on the apron, if you want to read exactly how it goes through. So it's not something that Freemasonry made up this right. Um, And, of course, many did the white apron. And it hasn't always been a white apron, but there's almost always been some sort of tradition of investiture. Investiture? I don't know. Exactly. No, across different cultures, it's been different things, but there's always been that investiture, that right of, Hey, you've made it. Here's, here's what distinguishes you among our, as a member of our craft. Yes. And it just so happens it's the apron for us, which white as well. I mean, that's just been one of those things that invokes that emotion in people that white seems pure. Yes. And to be fair, it didn't always start off as white. You know, the operative Masons wore pretty large, ugly, brown leather aprons but um because you know if they if they wore 
white aprons, I mean, you'd see all the dirt, right? It, it, that's the truth. Yeah. What's interesting is, uh, I mean, talking about the different cultures that had it, uh, apparently, uh, reading through like Mackey's uh, Encyclopedia of Freemason, he also refers back to Dr. Oliver, who is uh, a Freemason who wrote a lot of Masonic lectures in the early 1800s. Uh, and he spoke about the um, the Jewish um, priesthood that the lower orders would would wear white aprons uh, that were bound by girdle and it, they had to wear white until they gained entrance into the superior orders, uh, at which case they could then adorn them with, uh, you know, blue, purple, or crimson decorated with gold, uh, but upon a ground of fine white linen. Um, so, you know, maybe that's part also of the the heritage of having the white linen apron for the entered apprentice. True that. True, true. And yeah. um, one of the, you know, in Texas, you know, our aprons are very plain. Um, they're they're white. Uh, there's no decorations on them usually. Um, there's honestly very few uh, aprons that we have that have um, decorations. So if you go to uh, countries where the Grand Lodges are descended from the UGLE, um Usually you'll see aprons that have the rosettes on them. They'll have like little circles on them or other decorations. Um, if you go to other Masonic jurisdictions in the United States, you're either going to see the white aprons or aprons that are slightly more decorated, you know, where they'll maybe have like a blue outline or whatever. And um, in Texas, we just don't have any of that. Um, we have... Uh, the the most I can think of is that we have approved designs for certain officerships. Um, we have <clears throat> and we have a list of don'ts for past master aprons. Um, but there's a lot of flexibility within that, and so and it depends also on lodge to lodge. You know, some lodges you see a lot of people wearing um, non-standard aprons because they want to, um, and I fully support that because it's kind of fun. Um, or they're cheaper. Oh, or you're talking about decorated ones. Decorated ones, yeah. Yeah. And yes. um, so, you know, decorated ones. And that's people engaging in creativity. And oh. it may not be in line with the rules per se, but I like it because it's kind of fun to see that. Um, our lodge, the way that we do things, uh, and I really prefer this way, you know, like I, I like what we do. Um, you rarely see people wearing decorated aprons. Everybody kind of wears the nice leather aprons from the box. And even most of our past masters don't wear past master aprons. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, we don't even put them out anymore. So. But, you know, you go to 90, I would even say 95 to 98 percent of lodges, they have white cloth aprons that they set out for you to put on, which is unique to our country in particular. If you go anywhere else, uh, pretty much is what Roberto told us. Uh, you got to have your own apron which seemed really cool to me, but you go to 98% of lodges and measure those cloth aprons. They want, they're not going to be 16 by 16. My original master Mason apron I was presented for my lodge is not 16 by 16. It's not a regulation apron. Ours costs like two or $3 more of an apron. Uh, and you can get them in cloth or you can get them in leather, which, you know, Grand Lodge law says it is permissible to have cloth until such time you can afford lambskin. But well, I don't... So, you know, the, the whole prevalence of cloth aprons in lodges, um, and I was listening to the Masonic Roundtable, uh, and they were talking with a fellow whose name escapes me at this moment, but he specializes in kind of the history of the apron. And one of the things that he was talking about was that basically lodges would... Um, the, the, it, it originates in the starting of a lodge where people would charter a lodge and then they would realize, well, we don't really have aprons for visitors or anything like that. So they would buy um, a, a, like a dozen or whatever or two dozen leather aprons um, and the manufacturers would often throw in free cloth aprons um, as um, like a bonus or an incentive or whatever. Or sometimes gotcha. they would just they would just order cloth aprons for visitors with the expectation 
that their members would have uh, their own leather aprons. And uh, then it just got to be the point. After a while, you order enough of these, uh, either enough of the visitor sets or enough of the regular sets that come with bonus cloth ones, that all of a sudden you've got a lot of cloth aprons. And it becomes just kind of standard that people go, oh, I don't have to bring my apron to lodge. There's a box of aprons there, and they're all cloth aprons. Yeah. So that's why and you see, see most places with cloth aprons. That's the thing is that I know every Texas Master Mason is presented with an apron. And you ask nine out of ten, and they think they cannot wear that apron. Oh, yeah. And, no, you know, I, of I've course, had, to each— I've seen people straight up tell— brand new master masons you can't wear that until you die and it's like what no (laughs) and that's not what it says in the apron presentation i mean it's in clear print it's not a ritual you know it's not secret it says it's to be worn on all proper occasions and you know some people are just dead set on not wearing it and that's fine but here's my take is that when i stand before the great white throne i don't want a spotless apron i want that judger the judge there to see i've been in the core is working and this apron is well worn and well used so i've i've worn my apron almost the day after i was raised you know i would visit lodges and i'd have it i'd just carry it then as a when i got to be a district deputy one year i learned the value of having a case and I think all Master Masons would carry a apron case. You walk into a lodge with an apron case, and people think you're somebody all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. A, it's a, it is a unique feeling. But aside from that, that apron should be something that you greatly care for and love to carry on you with your Masonic journey. So when it's passed down or you're buried with it, it's well used. And it's tattered. It's torn. It's it's raised some brothers, you know. It's raised you. So do not be scared to wear that thing. And there's a real difference sitting in Lodge smelling that leather as opposed to some wrinkled cloth apron sitting on your lap. Yeah. And right. yeah. Um and not to knock necessarily so for example, and if your lodge only has cloth aprons, we don't mean to offend you. Because no. the best, and this is the way I look at it, the best apron is the one that you wear because you went to lodge. <laughs> if you're not Amen wearing an apron, to that. Yeah, if you're not wearing an apron, then you're not going to lodge, which means that there's no good apron for you. So the best apron you wear, right. whether it's you know cloth, leather, or in some cases paper, if you're a visitor, is the one that you wore yeah. to lodge. So, um, well, and myself, I mean, I will often take my my apron with me when I go out of state and visit a different lodge. And then I can make the choice right then. Do I want to wear mine? Or if I like their apron, like maybe it has kind of a cool design or, you know, something on the lodge that makes it stand out. You know, I have the choice right there. Do I want to wear the standard apron that they provide for visitors or wear my own? Yeah. And I, I bring yeah. my apron to other lodges. So. No, um, absolutely. Because a, a uh, lot of lodges, um, a lot of lodges, you know, they'll, they'll be, you know, using their own aprons and everything like that. And um, sometimes, you know, we've had this occur in our lodge where we ran out of the really nice aprons, right? And we had to go into, like, the reserves reserves. And so mm-hmm. I like, when I visit another lodge, I like to bring my own apron just so that I am not um, stressing the apron count, shall we say. Right. Not no. Yeah. And and look, if you have an issue with wearing the apron, you were presented that leather apron you got in your master's degree. You don't want to wear it. You never will buy another one. They're like 14 bucks a piece, you know, so for less than $20, you can have an extra leather apron that you can wear freely. If you're just set on not wearing your master's apron, uh, talk to your secretary because they may have an extra that they'll sell you. If not, you can order it right online at J.P. Luther, Texas Aprons. Yeah. Mail it right it, to you. It's one of those nice things that it, it's not, I mean, it's, and depending on the apron, they can get pretty pricey, but they're not always that expensive. So it's it's kind of nice because you do have affordable options within reach. Yeah. Well, I order the ones for our lodge, so I know exact the one with silk 
advertised the top of the line leather that JP Luther has silk backing the best of the best. It's like 1485. Nice. Nice. For the white leather apron. Yeah. Let's, I just Texas, think when Colorado, when you visit other lodges, you know, in other States, you can have the largest apron in the room. Yeah, How about exactly. That? <laughs> exactly. So I, I've never found a place to get a lambskin apron. Though. I guess leather counts, but I'm assuming what we're wearing is from a cow, not a lamb. Probably. Um, <laughs> it is what it is, I guess. Well, yeah, because there was a, a Lightfoot quote that says it should be lambskin. Otherwise, it's kaput, basically. It deteriorates the meaning of the apron when it's not lambskin, but. Until we find a lambskin apron maker, we'll wear the leather ones. Mm. So let, let's talk about Passmaster aprons, because that's something that we kind of don't really, like, we see people wearing Passmaster aprons in Texas, but we don't, is there is there an official Passmaster apron for Texas? There is. Is there? There is an official one. Um, let's see, I'm looking through the now, yeah, let's see. It shall be permissible for past masters to wear aprons with the same design and insignia as provided for the worshipful master, but the addition of the arc or quadrant or rocker under the points of the compasses would be optional. Would be optional. So are <laughs> would we have a square and a rocker? You can. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, would, would that also be blue bordered? Yes, that can be blue bordered because it's fashioned after the worshipful master, so it can look exactly like the worshipful masters, or you know, uh, with the square and compass, or it could have the rocker underneath with the blue border. Uh, let's see. It will be permissible to have embroidered upon the bib of the apron. So, if this is officer aprons. You can have embroidered on the bib of the apron the appropriate jewel of the office, and upon the body of the apron below the bib, the square encompasses circumscribing the letter G. The outside of the edge of the apron shall be bordered with blue silk, velvet, or braid, one inch in width, and the bib with the same material on half inch in width, one half inch in width. Interesting. So, in that case, would a compasses with a rocker and a sun be appropriate because it seems like under that wording uh, you might not be able to have a sun in there mm -mm, you can't so on the uh past master's apron you would have the square on the bib and then the square and compass on the body with the g inside and you could add the rocker if you choose ah, on the body okay. of the apron so basically i've so I've seen basically, I have yet to see a regulation past master apron then. You very rarely see regulation aprons. Most of the time, <laughs> the uh, the jewel of the office is embroidered on the body of the apron. Go look at ours, uh, which you'll have to dig out of the closet because we don't wear them anymore. Yeah, but no, uh, I don't think I've really ever seen us wearing the actual officer aprons. Nope. Yeah, we it's been years since we've worn those. Um which yeah. we'll go over that part of the law here in a second because we got called on the carpet for that. Um but my past master apron that I was presented from the lodge, it's the exact same as Sam Levesey, who's a past master from the late seventies. He got the same apron, which is not regulation past master <laughs> apron. Yeah. And I I'm sure you'll I'm sure y'all have seen mine. It's purple and has little tassels and it's all these cute things. Yours is things. purple? Mm -hmm. I always just thought that was a really dark blue. Mm. And maybe, maybe I may be colorblind. May, well, but you, I don't know. This is a weird time to find out, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this, maybe maybe it's just the past master's apron from New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> it they, is. Their, their past master aprons um, in in New Jersey... Uh, they have the 14 by 16 aprons, right? But when you become a past master, uh, it is still a plain white apron, but this time it's got purple trim all over. Yeah. Which I thought is kind of interesting. No, 
yeah, I know it, it. It's definitely got some purple in it because it stained the back of one of my other white aprons. It has like a purple square and compass on the back. Oh wow! I think it's my grandfather's white apron. Oh no! Because I have, yeah, oh. uh, you know, it's cool. Kind of the two melding. It didn't go through the leather, so that's good. But now I have them situated in there because I have my master's apron, uh, my past master apron, mm-hmm. my DDGM apron, and then. My grandfather from my mom's side and grandfather from my dad's side apron in the case. That's pretty cool. And I wear them all. I've worn both of my grandfather's aprons. Yeah, I've seen you kind of rotate through them. That's kind of fun. Yeah, it is. Um, But to kind of go back to the – so Grand Lodge Law says the regulation apron shall be – White lambskin of the following dimensions. The apron shall be 16 inches square with a drop of six inches to the triangular point of the bib. It will be permissible, which we're talking about law here. So those words mean things. Permissible means you can if you want. It's okay. So it will be permissible to have embroidered upon the bib of the apron the appropriate jewel of the office upon the body of the apron, which I read here a second ago. So if your officers choose to wear aprons that are their insignia, the lodge can do if they they like. If all the officers want to wear white aprons, they can do that too. Although usually it helps to have one unified front. You know, like everybody wears... Mm-hmm. Officer aprons, or nobody wears officer aprons. And it really, it boiled down to us for, you know, our officer aprons that we have now are not regulation, Texas regulation. So we just bought a bunch of leather white aprons for everybody to wear. And the officers just said, hey, we're going to wear those two until we get regulation officer aprons. And we just and then liked it, never it so happened. much. Yeah. I mean, we liked it so much. It looks so clean. Yeah, and it's nice Especially. though because it, it it makes it kind of like until people put on the jewels, you can't tell who's an officer. Exactly. So the thing that really nailed it home for us was in the degrees. So you know, when the candidates brought to light, he's not looking. At, oh, this guy's got this apron on, and this guy—they're all white. Right. They're Everyone's all, on the level. You got it. And it was just like, man, that just makes so much sense in Mason. So it's kind of a twist that we put on it for our own launch. It's not for everybody, I know, but of course we immediately had somebody call us in, you know, check to make sure it was permissible. <laughs> and we had somebody immediately call us on the so we haven't been told by authority that we can't do it as of yet. So we're continuing. But other than that, you know, you've got your Officer aprons, past master aprons. There's not many other people that get to wear decorated aprons. But there are some. <laughs> there are some, and but I've you got to earn them. list of them. <laughs> well, so I did have a question about yes. that. If a brother was a, is a mason, a regular mason in a Texas lodge, but they bring with them a, an apron that they were presented in a different jurisdiction or district, Mm-hmm. Would that still be acceptable to wear in a regular Texas lodge? It, it is. And and that's the thing that Grand Lodge, I mean, the, that's one of those laws that just really haven't been enforced because um, I very r- rarely wear my past master apron just because it's not Grand Lodge law. But nobody's ever said a word to me about it. I, I only wear it in our lodge now. And that's on very rare occasions. <laughs> but it would be if you're coming from another jurisdiction and you wear an apron that's unique to that jurisdiction, I would actually personally promote it. I want to see the diversity in masonry. Mm-hmm. Um, but it'd certainly be their choice. But yeah, they could wear that. Be totally cool. You know, too. Um, Before we get on to other decorated, I want to go through the uh, Article 274, which goes over member aprons. Because what we went through was the uh, officer regalia. That's Article 273. So when it comes to members, 
this is what I thought was unique. There's a little spot in there that talks about what kind of apron you should use. It says the regulation apron for members of the lodge shall be the same dimensions provided for the aprons of officers of the lodge and shall be made of white lambskin without border or decoration provided uh, uh, it shall not be mandatory upon any lodge to provide regulation regalia and aprons until such time as it may be able to do so. And such aprons may be made of white cloth. So it kind of shows where that's gotten lax because all your lodge has to say is we couldn't afford to buy regulation aprons. It says right there, it shall not be mandatory upon any lodge to provide regulation regalia and aprons until such time as it may be able to do so. So that's why you see them out there and there's not much that can be done. You know, the lodge has just got to decide that they want to buy it and be up to snuff. But if you find landscape aprons, let me know. <laughs> Send me the link. Yeah, we're going to need some of those someday. Oh, I buy one immediately. It's all I'd wear. I mean, I, it's it couldn't be more than double, maybe triple the price. But even then, it's going to be less than fifty bucks. That sounds like I have a new craft project to get into. <laughs> yeah, there you go, tanning Billy, some sheep eye. You just come home one day, Billy. What are you doing with that lamb? <laughs> I've got five acres. I think could you use some lambs on them, eating the some sheep eating the grass off of it. So let's do it. Hey, that's yeah, a positive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what's the other aprons, Gabe? So oh, should we talk about the dimensions of it first? Well, we, kind of the well, geometry of 16 by 16. Oh yeah. I guess we could talk about that. You want to give us an overview of that? Or do you so you know yeah. Billy and I talked about it because we we tried to get going on Sunday, but of course things got in the way. Um, but we stayed on Discord and talked about how this apron <clears throat> being 16 by 16 kind of alludes to the ancient problem of squaring the circle. And if you take the which first of all, you should Google Grand Lodge Regalia. And there's a YouTube video that comes up by a past master out of Tyler Lodge. Oh, his name escapes me. How is that not on my notes? Anyway. Are you, are you talking about the one that we played in Lodge not too far back? Yes. Okay. That exact so one. The name of that one is Regalia of the Grand Lodge of Texas. For anyone that yeah, wants that to one. learn something really fascinating regalia of the grand lodge of texas and it's on youtube and it's by the same guy that was in like platoon i think like he's the the narrator yeah he's okay. the narrator the research was done by past master out of tyler lodge which shame on me for not writing that in my notes who that was but anywho yeah and it's packed with a lot of really good information and it's only about 16 minutes long so it's not a very long watch and it's amazingly yeah. 80s it's <laughs> it does have an 80s feel to you can, it. You can feel the spandex on your legs when you watch the video. Yeah. So this is, I got all of these notes from there, which basically says that Lightfoot, when he made the apron, he created a 20 by 20 inch uh, grid and then grew, drew a 20 inch circle on the grid. So basically taking up the whole thing. Uh, drew two straight lines from the bottom center to the top, create, kind of making a V through the circle um, where the two lines, the V intersected with the top of the circle. He drew two straight lines down, connected those at the top and bottom, which created a 16 inch square. And then from the circumference of the circle to the corners of that 16 inch square, created the bib which had the six inch drop circle and square that's created in there kind of alludes to that problem we were talking about which was squaring the circle which i think we touched on in the fibonacci sequence circle representing god square the man trying to get more godlike qualities in our life 
hence squaring the circle for a uh, speculative mason. Ooh, well, all, I, all of that I packed into a, one shape. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and I found um, another reference, right, to the fact that we use the number 16 is also kind of special in that 16 is the square root of 16 is a square in itself. Right. And, uh, the phrase square mm-hmm. square used to also be called squaring the circle. And it was meant to, it was a phrase that was used to refer to trying to do the impossible. Uh, because, you know, when you square a circle, because pi itself is a transcendental number, and you can never nail down the exact value of, of pi. So you have to use an approximation in order to square it. So it's never exact. Yeah. So, yeah. That's hence squaring the circle. Exactly. And I think that's so fitting because masonry is teaching men to be on that trajectory of perfection. I think we all kind of realize nobody's ever going to be perfect. Um, so it's an impossible task, but yet we still go after it. You know, I, I, I'm always fascinated by those kind of journeys, like the search for absolute, absolute zero. You're not going to get there, but they're still looking for it. You know what I mean? So hence the squaring the circle. And that's why you should wear the 16 by 16. Not just because it's bigger and cooler, huh? Exactly. I mean, it's, it is a Texas thing, but it definitely has deep esoteric meaning behind it. Why it's 16 by 16 with a six inch drop. And like I said before, you can really get you some rabbit holes starting to you dig you some rabbit holes. If you go watch that YouTube video, it's great. Good enough to where we watched it in lodge. And I got several compliments for that. And I was like, man, that was easy. I need to do that more. <laughs> yep. It was cool. I love it. I'd love to do a, a recreation of that one. That's maybe a little bit more up to date. Got a little bit better graphics. Um, doesn't get aprons backwards, but um <laughs> There, absolutely there could be some updating the technology we have today to where you could actually like draw the aprons out as you're going there's oh, a, God, it'd there's be so a cool lot of things that could be like done fading in and you know fading out it'd be amazing yeah but it's so, good check it out grand yeah. launch regalia so we're going to talk about the um grand officer aprons in texas right if anybody has looked at our Grandmaster's apron, it looks very strange compared to a lot of Grandmaster aprons, right? You know, a lot of Grandmaster aprons, they've got the um, the the Grandmaster insignia, and it's covered in gold and blue and tassels and everything like that. And um, our Grandmaster's apron is purple, and it's got a ten-pointed star on it. You know, <laughs> and it's, like, very colorful. It's not very... Uh, grand mastery when you look at other uh, jurisdictions. And so a lot of people look at the Texas grand master's apron and they go, what the hell is that? Um, and obviously I may be biased as a Texas Mason, but the Texas grand master's apron is my favorite grand master's apron of them all because it's packed with symbolism and it's beautiful. So, yeah. Well, and I was surprised to find how packed every one of the grand lodge aprons are with symbolism, you know, cause I've seen just from attending grand lodges where people dignitaries from other jurisdictions come and they're typically, their aprons are just like you described lots mm-hmm. of gold, lots of tassels, a lot of dangly things, you know, and they're oh, pretty, them don't get me wrong. Yeah. But it's easy. You know, they got the insignia of their office. The symbolism is simple where the grand master's apron you're going to have to go check out a book or something to really understand the symbolism behind that because it's deep. Yeah. Um, so the same thing with the persuasion, the Tyler, I mean, you name it, yeah. all of them. So a lot Deacon. of this, a lot of this info is going to be from that video that we were talking about regalia of the grand lodge of Texas. Um, uh, some of this info that we're going to be talking about is pulled from some, uh, of the, it's, uh, some of this is based off of material that I found on the uh, Societas Rosicrucian, R- R- Rosicruciana in Anglia, right? So SRIA, the English version of the Masonic Rosicrucians. And uh, some of this is based off of some Golden Dawn stuff that I found. So, um, What? Yeah, don't worry about it. 
So, Clandy. Anyway, I love me some. Golden it's not in Clandy. It's it's weird, is what it is. It's, yeah. Any, anyway, proceed, sir. So we used to have more traditional grandmastery aprons up until about 1931, and that's when Jewel P. Lightfoot. Uh, and at this point in time, he was a past grandmaster, um, but he was a grandmaster, and he decided to redesign the grandmaster's aprons. And um, and I mean, he went from top to bottom. The only aprons that were changed after he designed them were the Grand Organist and the Grand Photographer. And I think those were actually just added. I don't think they were changed. Um, for the Grand Organist, you've got a lyre on a bib. So the Greek in, the Greek harp, basically. You know, the, the bib has the lyre on it. And on the body of the apron itself, that has got an hour, hourglass with wings. And then on the Grand Photographer's apron... He's got a painter's palette on the bib of the apron, and then he's got a trowel in the circle on on the body. Um, and the trowel in the circle, you know, he's spreading the friendship of masonry as, and additionally, like an artist would mix paint on, on their palette with a trowel. Uh, and then the hourglass of, with wings on the grand organist's apron is supposed to represent the, represent the relentless passage of time as expressed through music. Those yep. were added in the 1990s. Those are primary, not going to be really the focus of what we're talking about here because those are really cool, but there's not as much symbolism in there. Um, but there's there's several classes of aprons in uh, the grand line. Ap- uh, in the grand line, you're going to have aprons that have inverted five pointed stars on the bottom corners, so left and right, and then you'll have two aprons that have crescent moons in the left and right bottom corners. There's one apron that has a half moon, and there's one apron that has a full moon. Um, and then the rest of the aprons have rising and setting suns in the bottom left and right corners. Okay? So the ones, and we'll talk about them kind of in ascending order, right? So the inverted five pointed star on the bottom corners, we have. The Grand Organist, the Grand Photographer, uh, the Grand Tyler, the Grand Persuivant, the Grand Junior Steward, the Grand Senior Steward, and the Grand Junior Deacon. And so let's you know talk about that for a second. So the Grand Tyler has uh, a set of crossed swords on the bib of his apron. And on the body, he's got nine arches. And those are the ni- nine mm-hmm. arches that you find in King Solomon's Temple. And so... In the strictly Blue Lodge context, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, right? Like, what are these nine arches? These nine arches will sound very familiar to anybody who has heard the Royal Arch Degree, Sacred History, um, and or who has gone through the Cryptic Degrees. And so you see the nine arches in the Cryptic Degrees. Uh, and you hear about them in the Royal Archmason Sacred History Lecture. I was going to say, I know Jewel P. Lightfoot was very influenced by the Royal Arch. Yeah, we're going to degrees gonna on the see, We're going to see that he was very big on on capitular masonry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so if you if you're familiar yeah. with the story of the preservation of the Master's Word, then you'll have seen the nine arches. Yeah, so on that, I actually found another um, story, right, that uh, is from, if you read Antediluvian Masonry, um, there's a story about uh, Enoch, that uh, one of the ancestors of uh, of Noah, in that he was actually commanded by God to build a temple in Mount Calvary, which Calvary itself is. Uh, located around Jerusalem, uh, some places, some people believe it's where uh, where Christ was crucified at uh, Golgotha, or some people believe that it's actually Mount Zion, uh, but it's in that same area. Um, so, in this story, though, he created this temple, and there were nine uh, porches with nine doors that led to the inside of the temple. Uh, in that he was the only person that God had given the secrets of masonry to, that even his, uh, even the the two people who helped him build it, um, 
didn't know exactly what was going on, going on. They built it out of faith. Uh, so I think it's kind of interesting, uh, especially with what we were talking about earlier, Gabriel, uh, today mm-hmm. about the fact that the Royal Arch degree, those uh, nine arches may have existed before yes. uh, the temple itself was built. Which is kind so of interesting, interesting, like in context with the cryptic degrees. Right. So we're, yeah, we're, was, we're being uh, kind no. of weird and mysterious, but there's some stuff that we just can't talk about. But yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's interesting because when you say Enoch was uh, given the secrets of masonry, you know, we need to understand you're talking about operative masonry, right? In order to build these nine arches, it took some real knowledge, real understanding of geometry. Well, and I'm not really sure because they talk about Lux, right? The true religion mm-hmm. kind of gets into uh, a sketchy subject when you talk about, uh, you know, masonry as some people consider it a religion. So it's not real clear on whether it's operative mason masonry or if it's speculative masonry. Uh, but yeah, it was mm-hmm. Enoch, Jared, and Methuselah were the three architects who constructed the subterranean edifice. But out of the three of them, only Enoch had been spoken to by God and in, in given the secrets of its construction. It's very interesting. That's awesome. So those nine arches are pretty old. Yeah, they're, right. and the they're whole older than we think. <laughs> right, and, and the purpose of them being built is, again, this was before Noah and the flood. So the purpose was that he was told to keep the secrets of, of masonry. Uh, in this temple, that this subterranean temple, um, in preparation for the day when mankind would be wiped out uh, for a future brother after that period to come in, one who is worthy to rediscover the secrets. Oh, how about that? That's kind of weird. Hmm. I've hmm. heard that somewhere before. <laughs> Same here. Protecting it from floods or fire, whatever may wipe us out. Yeah, so it's that's kind of interesting because you get to see some of those, the the pre heramic myth masonry um, that has worked its way into, I guess, regular modern masonry. But uh, let's move on to the Grand Persuivant, right? So this is another reference to um, Enoch, right? The, his, uh, the, the emblem of the Grand Persuivant is the triple tau cross within a circle. And so the triple tau cross, it, it literally looks like three T's joined at the end of the T together at right angles. The triple tau also, though, signifies the three grand masters. Um, so, you know, Solomon, uh, Solomon Hiram, yes. and Hiram, right? Like, it's the three of them. The, that's what it signifies. And so the triple tau, you actually find that on the aprons of past masters in usually descended um, uh, jurisdictions because they've got one on, I think like one on the bib and then one in each corner and right. you'll see the triple tau. So they split it up into three individual tows, but that's part of that. Um, but so and that's the grand persuivant, right? Yes, that's the grand persuivant. And so, um, his job is to take care of the jewelry and everything like that and to uh, prepare visitors and stuff, I think. Mm-hmm. Yes, something like that. Seeing them about the Grand Lodge floor and things like that. Yes. I had That's to actually, one officer. I actually had to go up to our Grand Persuivant, uh, Worshipful uh, Pimentel, and I had to go, so what does the Grand Persuivant do? And he broke it down for me real quick, which, you know. That's the guy to get it to break it down for you. He's he's yeah. super, super knowledgeable for sure. Uh, but it's one of those offices that ever since I've been a Mason, everybody's got jokes for the Grand Persuivant. Like that's never been told before, you yeah. know, because he he takes care of the Grand Master's jewels. So you can see where jokes come out of that. You know, Brother Will is going to like hunt you down and kill you now, right? Oh, dude, don't get me started. The first year <laughs> I was raised, uh, one of my dad's buddies from high school was Grand Persuivant. And he got it way worse than Will Pimentel got it. There's there's funny things out there that guys have done to him that oh, don't give pale people in ideas. comparison. To don't how give people they... ideas. You can't, be go- you can't go doing that. No, no. Let's, let's and trust about... me. 
if you come up with a joke for the persuasion, it's been done 10 times. So keep it to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the grand junior steward. And so he and the grand senior steward both have cornucopias on the bib of their aprons. So the grand junior steward, he wears an inverted isosceles right angled triangle that takes up the bottom half of a circle. So if you picture a circle, draw a horizontal line across that, and then just have um, lines going down from the intersection of that line and the circle to the midpoint of the circle. So obviously, audio medium, visual imagery, you're going to have to look this up. Sorry. Um, but so it's an upside, it's an upside down triangle, you know, that's, uh, in a circle. And, um, there you go. the Texas that's logic easy. research made a point to call this a three pointed star, which I thought was kind of interested. But yeah. if, you, if you look at al- 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 alchemy, um, in alchemical texts, the inverted triangle is a symbol for matter. Right. And so, uh, it's also, when you look at Kabbalah, it's tied to Bina, uh, one of the Kabbalistic Sephirot, um, and I think it's also tied to the planet Saturn. I'm not 100 percent on that. I had to. I have a question mark written there. Um, so the Grand Senior Steward, he's got a cornucopia on his bib as well, and he's got a square within a circle, which uh, TL, the Texas Lodge of Research calls a four pointed star. Um, and the square within the circle is the signet of Aaron, the high priest, and so he he wore a breastplate with this symbol on it. Um, called the Breastplate of Righteousness. And um, the square inside the sign- uh, sign- circle is emblematic of the Sephirot Chesed, and it's also emblematic of the Tetrad, or yod heh right? The sacred name of God. And so it also represents the four elements in conjunction, because you've got four sides. And it's emblematic of Jupiter, I think. So... Um, that's kind of cool because we're already jumping in here, you know. Um, the Grand Junior Deacon has a dove on the bib of his apron, and so does the Grand uh, Junior. What? <laughs> Hold on. You said a dove. A dove, yes. Um, it's got a, He's. They've Hold got. On. And if you look at their jewels. If you look at their jewels, they wear doves. Um, and in a lot of jurisdictions, the the deacons wear doves, not compasses with moons and suns. I got to pull this up. Yeah, I'm, I'm scrolling through the video right now. So, as you're talking. Well, no, no, go go look at the Grand Lodge officers page on Texas Grand Lodge website, and look at their the jewels they wear. The jewels they wear are the same as the ones that are on their apron. So anyway, um, so the the Grand Junior Deacon's got a dove on his, the bib of his apron, and he's got he- a. A five-pointed star. Yeah. But see, he's got a five-pointed star. Uh, some people call it a pentacle, right? But the five-pointed star in the circle is the signet of Solomon. That's his personal signet. It's a symbol of Masonic light. It's emblematic of the um, lessons that are taught in the master's degree. Um, five-pointed stars. One, one of the things that's kind of cool is that five-pointed stars are made up of infinitely repeating triangles. So you can trace yeah. you can trace a five pointed star, like just like the way that you drew it in elementary school, and you can go from start to finish and keep tracing it over and over and over and over again. The five pointed star repeats infinitely. And, and I, I mean, I'm my wig's flipping because all the research I put into this podcast, I never noticed a dove. I mean, I've never even heard of a dove as a Masonic symbol. I'm racking my brain to ever hear that. I would love to hear the symbol. Well, think because think back to the ark and the anchor, and that kind of goes hand in hand. It it's, does, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it is. It's it's emblematic I was just of, never... of peace, and it is also it's emblematic of peace, and it is also emblematic of antediluvian masonry. Oh, antediluvian masonry. So no Noahite masonry, if you will. Oh. So, I... I'm pinning down a deacon, a grand deacon, right? I mean, soon yeah. to get their take on the dove. I just naturally assumed it was the same as what's in Lodge, you know, with the square nope. compass and the moon or the sun. You would be uh, incorrect, sir. <laughs> I t- you t- 
totally learn something new right here, right now. <laughs> I'm looking into the old dove, Masonic dove. <laughs> yeah, so that's it's kind of cool. And there's a bunch of other stuff that goes into it. Like, um, if you look at a five pointed star, right the, the the one that you see on the Grand Junior Deacon's apron. Think about the Vertuvian man, the one that drew, Da Vinci drew. Like it's it's a, the human form. Uh, arm and mm-hmm. uh, arms and legs and head. Um, if you look at the four elements as making up the four lower ones, it kind of symbolizes spirit over the four lower elements. Um, right. In the planetary yep. system, it's emblematic of Mars, right? Um, and depending on who you ask, it can be emblematic of the tetragrammaton versus the tetragrammaton with a syllable added. So, Four syllables, yod he vad he, or vav he, sorry, yod he vav he, four, versus five syllables, yod he shem vav he, right? So, Yahweh versus Yeshua. And so, and of course, I apologize for my Hebrew pronunciation. It's awful. (laughs) (laughs) I know uh, there's a website out there that traces the pattern of Saturn, not Saturn, Venus third brightest light in the sky uh over a seven year period and it dang near makes a five-pointed star almost exactly how about that so you can watch venus move on this website over a seven year period and watch it hit five points it's pretty pretty interesting that's kind of crazy i love it the um so the so you know we've talked about and so we've talked about it all, a lot already about these aprons, but we're not even all the way in. Those are just the five pointed star aprons, the ones that have the five pointed star in the bottom corners. There's two aprons that have crescent moons in the bottom left and right corners, and those are those of the Grand Senior Deacon and the Grand Marshal. So the the Grand Senior Deacon, just like the Grand Junior Deacon, has a dove on the bib of his apron. And Got his, a dove. Yep. And his <laughs> emblem is not a star, right? Most of them are stars or star-like objects, um, but his is not. Um, his is the 47th problem of Euclid, circumscribed by a circle, um, and it's the symmetrical form. It's not the offset form, and that's important because we need the symmetrical form to create the aprons of the higher-level grand officers. Um, and so the 47th problem of Euclid... We've already talked about this a lot, um, but it's also it's emblematic of the divine order of creation as well as a bunch of other stuff, which you should go back and listen to our podcast on that one. <laughs> so, um, so then the other crescent moon apron is the Grand Marshal, uh, it and he has a um, two crossed batons on the bib of his apron. So whereas the uh, Grand Persuivant has two vertically crossed wands on the bib of his apron, he's got the Grand Marshal has two horizontally crossed batons. And, uh, looks just like an X. Yes, it looks like an X. Yeah. And so his the body of his apron has a six-pointed star in a circle, uh, what we might call the Star of David, right? So um, it's very familiar to our Jewish brethren. And it's, it's so kind of one of the cool things about the Star of, of David or the six-pointed star is that it's created of two interlocking and opposed equilateral triangles, right? Um, one of the cool things about it as well is that uh, alchemical elements use four symbol. The four elements are symbolized by a triangle, an inverted triangle, a triangle with a bar through it, and an inverted triangle with a bar through it. And when you combine all of those together you get the six-pointed star. It's kind of cool. And so it's kind of, it it's also represents like the unity of all the elements. Um, the six points also represent the six days of creation. Um, and it's associated with the sun. So the Grand Marshal's apron is actually super cool. And, and of course, with the Star of David too, um, like if you look at some of the old writings uh, from the old, like 1700s, um, like a lifeless levy. Uh, he uses it to symbolize as above, so below, which is something you hear repeated, you know, mm-hmm. from time to time. Yep. That's definitely a rabbit hole. Some should go down. Yeah, no, that's, that's, you know, and that's just opening up the hermetic box right there. It's yes. awesome. 
So the there's a lot of symbolism in the Grand Marshal's apron. Um, right. And what's interesting too also is the 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 crescent moon um, was used as uh, there was a mathematical theorem called the loon of Hippocrates that was used. Uh, and if you look at it, it looks like an inverted ver- version of the uh, of the junior Stewart's deacon, I believe, where it has the triangle pointing down. Uh, if you extrapolate that and create a moon using the outside of the circle um, in an arc that touches the top of the circle and the side of the circle, uh, then it creates a a partial solution to squaring the circle, which loops back to what we had talked about in the very beginning with the whole problem of squaring the circle. Oh, wow. That's cool. So it's, again, it's a visual thing you have to look at, but it's the Lune, L-U-N-E, of Hippocrates. Yeah, there's a lot of material in this episode that our listeners are going to have to look up, unfortunately. <laughs> that, that's, that's the way it that's is with symbolism. For. Yeah, I mean that's what we're here for. We're not. I mean, we don't know a whole lot, but we can certainly get you started on a rabbit hole. Yeah. So the next the next apron that we have is the only apron that has half moons in the corners, and that is the apron of the Grand Orator. Um, and so he's got a scroll on his bib on the bib of his apron, and the body of his apron has the two little half moons, and then it has a seven pointed star. On the apron, and so this is the signet of Moses. Uh, like Solomon's five-pointed star, the seven-pointed star is endlessly repeating. Right, so you can start tracing it, and you'll come right back to the beginning, and over and over and over again. Uh, it's you know, it uses sem- a seven as a number of perfection, so it reminds you of God's divinity. It is representative of the star of Venus, right? So, which is not really a star, but that's what they call it. Uh, it's emblematic of the seven planets as described in alchemical texts. And it's also emblematic of the seven, quote-unquote, lower sephirot in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. So in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, you have the three um, heavenly sephirot, which represent the heavenly realms. So you have Keter, the crown, Chachma, which is wisdom, and Bina, understanding. Right, And then you've got the seven lower Sephirot, which represent the world and uh, God's creation. So they're lower in order than the three uh, heavenly ones. So you've got Heresed, Gevura, Tiferet, Netzach, and Hod, Yesod, and Malkuth. Right? And so those are all related more strongly to earth than they are to heaven. And so the seven-pointed star is representative of that lower portion of the tree of life. Going back to Hippocrates again, he also uh, wrote that the septenary number, the number seven, by its occult virtue, uh, tends to the accomplishment of all things, is the dispenser of life and fountain of all changes. And he actually divided uh, man into seven different ages throughout his lifetime. Ooh, that's cool. What are they? Do you have the ages on you? Uh, Actually, so it kind of breaks it down. So at seven months, a child may be born and live. Uh, and not before, um, a child was not named until he was seven days old. Uh, the teeth spring out at the seventh month. Uh, he were, they're renewed in the seventh year when infancy then becomes childhood. At thrice seven years, the faculties are developed and manhood commences. Uh, at four times seven, man's in full possession of his strength. At five times seven, he is fit for the business of the world. At six times seven, he becomes grave and wise, or never. Uh, and at seven times seven, he is in his apogee. And from that time, he then decays. That's so interesting. I guess they're so they're defining yeah. forty nine as like the perfect middle age. Well, actually, and I'm sorry, it does go on further. At eight times seven, he's in his first climacteric. Uh, and at nine times seven, or sixty three, he's in his grand climacteric, or his years of danger. He's oh, death is on his doorstep. Man. Right. And that at, at 10 times seven or three score years and 10, he has by the royal prophet been pronounced a natural period of human life. So I guess they figured, you know, after that, there's nothing else. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Me, buddy. It's interesting that he said, you know, your manhood starts at thrice times seven when you're 21. Uh, 
you know, because that's pretty close. I was reading an article that's talking about your frontal cortex, your decision making part of your brain. It's not fully developed till you're 24, and r- really and truly until you're 21 isn't of much use. That's why teenagers are thought as so impulsive. Right. Huh. You know, uh, so it's really interesting that he kind of pegged that right when the frontal cortex starts taking over. Mm-hmm. Where, you, where you're like, mm, maybe I should save some money. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Shakespeare also writes of these seven ages in his uh, play As You Like It. It's in Act Two, Scene Seven. Mm, the great plagiarizer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the uh, next apron that we have is the only apron that has a full moon uh, on it. And so it's got two little full moons on each cor- corner. It's the Grand Chaplain's apron. Uh, he's got a Bible on the bib of his apron and on the main um, body of his apron, he's got two tablets of the law, right? So they're two big stone ones. They look kind of like the tablets that Moses might've carried down or whatever, but they're two separate laws, right? One of them is representative of the laws of man. And then the other one is representative of the laws of God. Um, But they're joined together in one block. So if you break the laws of man, you break the laws of God. If you break the laws of God, you break the laws of man. It's kind of interesting. So they're inseparable and intertwined. Um, And on top of the two tablets of the law, uh, he's got the squares. And it's interesting because instead of, you know, we've talked about before, like the different configurations of the symbolic lights during degrees. Um, In this apron, you see what, they call the distinct. The, there's a distinction between the square that you would use for an entered apprentice, the square that you would use for a fellow craft, and the square that you would use for a master mason. And so the squares for the EA and FC are offset. Are they're offset? Like the length is twice as long as the width, or um, or the height. I guess I don't know. Uh, and they're so they're opposite each other. And then the master masons um, is equilateral, and that's that's. Um, that that's where the compass is. It's placed on top of the master masons one, but they actually have separate, distinct squares for the entered apprentice and fellow craft, which I thought was interesting. So it ties back into uh, the lights and the way that we uh, that ideally they should be or- oriented during a degree. Yeah, that's a pretty apron. <clears throat> and as far as I know, that's the only office you can hold and not be a past master of a lodge. The the Grand Chaplain? So, yeah, technically you don't have to be a member of Grand Lodge. Oh, that's kind of cool. Because, that, yeah, that's a big misconception. Most people think they're a member of the Grand Lodge of Texas, but they are not. They're a member of their lodge until they become a past master. Then they're a member of the Grand Lodge of Texas. Hmm. I didn't know that about the Grand Chaplain. That's kind of cool. <laughs> yep. So... Now we get to the rising and setting sun aprons, right? So there's one, two, three, four, five, six aprons that have rising and setting suns. And they are the Grand Treasurer, the Grand Secretary, the Grand Junior Warden, the Grand Senior Warden, the Deputy Grand Master, and the Grand Master. So the Grand Treasurer, he's got an eight-pointed star, and by the way, if you watch Regalia of the Grand Lodge of Texas, they flipped the Grand Treasurer and Grand Secretary descriptions. So you'll be seeing the Grand Treasurer stuff when he's talking about the Grand Secretary. But anyway, uh, he's got an eight-pointed star on his apron. Uh, it's the signet of Melchizedek. And so Melchizedek is the um, the king of Salem, and he... he um, he blessed Abraham when he came back from, uh, I think killing a bunch of people <laughs> Don't disregard this. So anyway, but it's called the star. So it's referred to as the star of Mercury. Uh, sometimes it's called the Octa alpha or the octangle. It symbolizes, uh, divine omnipotence, uh, because of the way that this particular eight pointed star is drawn. This one is also infinitely repeating. Um, you can, there's ways to draw eight pointed stars that are not infinitely repeating, However, this one, it also is infinitely traceable. Uh, it's kind of cool because it displays both triangles and right angles. It's got squares, it's got uh, triangles, it's got all sorts of stuff going on. And on the bib of the apron, it's got the cross keys, like you would expect. Um, 
What's cool about the eight pointed star is that it represents the the four the four elements of creation, um, but operating in both positive and negative capacities. So, like in one one corner would represent air, and then another one would represent lack of air. Um, there's an interesting quote that I found about it regarding um, on the the stuff that I was pulling from the more Golden Dawn inspired um, interpretations of the stars and things. It says it is a further it is further a potent symbol representing the binding together of the concentrated positive and negative forces of the elements under the name of uh, Adonai or ya- Yahweh Adonai. Um, and forget not that Adonai is the key of Yahweh, Yahweh, which I didn't understand what this meant, <laughs> but I thought it was important. So I concluded. It. <laughs> so there's a couple of things on here where I'm like, I don't know what this means, but, uh, okay. You know? Yeah. So the Pythagoreans actually, um, they believed that the number eight was special because it is the first cube being formed by, uh, two by two by two. Oh, cool. Uh, and that it actually signified friendship, prudence, counsel, and justice. That is cool. Yep. And then some in Christian symbology, too, uh, some call it the symbol of the resurrection because Jesus was uh, risen on the eighth day and the day after the seventh. Uh, so it can also be looked at uh, in that light as well. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of underlying Christian symbolism in some of this stuff that we've talked about, like the Yahweh versus Yeshua sort of stuff. Um. The uh, but there's also some slightly less Christian stuff going on there too. Um, for example, the Grand Secretary, uh, his apron, he's got the cross quills like you do in your regular secretary's apron. Um, but on the body of his apron, he's got the nine pointed star, the signet of Enoch. Right. So we talked about the triple tau, uh, the, the that um, the Grand Persuasion. Yeah, the tip, the Grand Persuasion wears the triple towel on his apron, and it's emblematic of the signet of Enoch, which is the nine pointed star, right? And so some systems call it an enneagram. Um, this star is associated with the moon. It's got three equilateral triangles rotating around the center, and they're all interlocked. So this is not an infinitely repeating triangle. Um, not sorry, not an infinitely repeating star. But it's three distinct, distinct interlocked triangles, which represent, and I quote, the triple ternary of the three alchemical principles, right? So each of those triangles represents one of the three main alchemical ingredients. So you've got one triangle for sulfur, one triangle for mercury, and one triangle for salt. So sulfur it, alchemically is the combination of air and fire, and it represents the soul of a person. Uh, mercury is the alchemical combination of water and air, and it represents a person's life force. And then salt is the physical body, and that's water and earth. So that's kind of what you see in uh, the Grand Secretary's apron, in that nine-pointed star. And it's emblematic of the divine presence of the Lord, uh, supposedly. Most of these are emblematic of the divine presence of the Lord somehow. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, now we're going to move on to the three, uh, what I would call the Grand Line Officers. because uh, Or not three, uh, sorry, four. Because this this is where the progression from, you know, elected to Grand Master comes. And that's the Grand Junior Warden, the Grand Senior Warden, and the Deputy Grand Master, and the Grand Master. And we talked about on the Grand Senior Deacon's apron how it's important that he has the 47th problem of Euclid in the symmetrical form, because this plays into the creation of the grand officer's aprons later on. And so they're all based around the symbolic lodge room floor. So the grand junior warden has the plum on the bib of his, on the bib of his apron. And he's got, if you refer to Lightfoot, he's got the outline of the symbolic lodge room floor um, as defined by a Masonic apron in the form of the 47th problem of, of Euclid. So if you take a 16 by 16 apron with a 16 inch dro- with a six inch drop, drop in the bib, you unfold the bib and you create squares that extend out of each side of the bib, you've got that perfect you know 47th problem of Euclid. From that, and you'll have to refer to Lightfoots to see what I'm talking about. 
you can create a lodge room floor. And so the Grand Junior Warden's apron highlights specifically the 47th problem of Euclid in the lodge room floor. The Grand Senior Warden's apron has the same design, but instead of highlighting the 47th problem of Euclid, um, it highlights the Passion Cross, or the Cavalry Cross, that you can make from the 47th problem of Euclid. So, you know, we talked about some of the underlying Christian symbolism. Here is some of the not-so-underlying, but rather very obvious Christian symbolism. You've got a Passion Cross in the middle of the symbolic lodge room floor, right? And that you're going to see that on the yep. Grand Senior Warden's apron. And on the Deputy Grandmaster's apron, he's got a square on the bib of his apron. He's got the same symbolic lodge room floor layout as the Junior and Senior Wardens do. Um, but this time, his his has a tessellated border. Oh, and the Senior Warden also has this, but they've got both got the tessellated border around the lodge room floor. And instead of the Cavalry Cross, the Deputy Grandmaster has an onk on on his apron. So it's still got the 47th problem of Euclid and it's still got the keystone that you can make out of the 47th problem of Euclid, but it's got a, an Egyptian onk on it because you can make that geometrically out of it. And this brings us to the grandmaster's apron. We've oh. talked, you know, we've talked about the weird, funny purple apron that, you know, it's got a bunch of stars on it and stuff. Um, it, we talked about the 47th problem of Euclid being ma- used to make a Royal Archmason's Keystone, which is why you need the sym- symmetrical repetition of it. Um, but he's got one Keystone, two Keystones, that, 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 that. He's got ten Keystones symmetrically overlaid on his apron. Um, and using the Keystones, you can actually create a perfect, um, not quite circle, but they perfectly line up with each other again. So it, it creates a 10-sided shape that is used to draw a 10-pointed star. So this one is kind of interesting. The 10-pointed star is not drawn from center to center. It's it's two pentagrams overlaid over each other. So you've got one right side up and one upside down. The right side up one is filled in. It's a regular five-pointed star. And then the upside down one is just an outline but they're all used to connect the keystones that are arranged in the circle. And it's just a beautiful apron. It's very colorful. Y'all will have to look it up because, uh, you know, obviously we can't present it on an audio podcast, but it is very wonderful. It is one of my favorite aprons of all time. Um, Yeah, that Grandmaster's apron is very, very ornate. It goes deep. I mean, if you just kind of skim and look at it, it doesn't seem special special but when you walk up to that apron case and take a close look at grandmaster's apron you can see there's some geometry going into that thing yeah i'd love to like sketch one up in in uh, uh, on the computer and like print it out and just hang it on the wall like in terms of just the, the logo of it because yeah. the, the 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 emblem is just incredible and so uh, I try to uh, find a little bit of symbolism for this one. The only thing I could really find is that it seems to be emblematical of the Ten Sephirot, but again, I have a Kabbalistic bent, which some people don't have, so this is maybe just my own personal biases. So I, I love the fact also that, uh, I mean, very prominent in there is you do see the five-pointed stuff, you know, overlaid over the, you know, where you have them facing the different directions, but it's so Texan in the middle of all of this, symbolism you also have texas and when you look at it there was a speech given by uh, one of the secretary of states during the republic of texas where he said that uh, the texas star was chosen specifically to represent the the country of texas because it was emblematical of the five points of fellowship Hmm, i smell a conspiracy here the masons did it (laughs) (laughs) And if you if you really want to take a have some time to look at one, we actually have one in our temple building. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's on the second floor, but um, it, it's it it's is beautiful. it's in that library, and it's and it's a little bit older, so it's a little bit faded, but it, it's still beautiful. Mm-hmm. So some uh, there's a I've actually gone up to it and just kind of stared at it a couple of times. Oh yeah, several times myself. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's two of them. There's one in the library, 
one on the far left uh, in a case. You don't even have to go in the library. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that one is like guarded right by the right ghosts. Right. So don't you think about trying anything, folks? Yeah. But um, exactly. So there's there's two other aprons that are associated with um, Grand Lodge officers. Uh, and those are the DDGM apron and the Committee on Work apron. And so one of us has actually worn the DDGM apron. I'm looking at you, Rit. Um, mm -hmm. And so Rit keeps one, and he wears it every once in a while. It's got the, the trowel on the bib. You know, he's spreading that cement of brotherly love. And it's got yep. the year on the bottom corner. So Ritz has 20 on one corner and then 16 on the other corner. And then the compasses are open on a quadrant of 60 degrees. It's a moon instead of the G. So you don't get that sun, but you get that moon. And then it's surrounded, the wreath that's surrounded uh, is half corn and half acacia. And so Ritz got Correct, a fancy sir. one. He's, he's all fancy. So It is a nice apron. <laughs> it's got the buckle, so it fits nice as I get chubbier. Uh, well, I'll have to do a lodge workout program or something. Yeah, exactly. But uh, then the other apron that we've talked about is the Committee on Work apron. They actually, I did not know this because I've never seen anybody wear it because mm -hmm. uh, the only time I've interacted with Committee on Work members is actually outside of a lodge. Um, but uh, the Committee on Work apron is the 47th problem of Euclid on the bottom of the apron. It's a little bit smaller. And in the triangle, in the triangle, and the upper two squares, they have the plum square and level. And so I thought it's a, it's a very simple apron, but it, I've never seen one in the wild before. So maybe one of these days, days I'll see it. Yeah, you'll see it at Grand Lodge because Committee on Work talks a lot, and you just have to check out their apron as they walk up. Oh boy, do they talk a lot! I'm just kidding. <laughs> Please don't hate yeah. me. <laughs> so the other two aprons that I can think of that have emblems, they're not Grand Lodge aprons, but they are two lodges under our Grand Lodge that have dispensation to use specifically different aprons. And those are Tranquility Lodge 2000 and the Texas Lodge of Research. And mm -hmm. so uh, the... Those are the only two I know of. Yeah, and I, there might be another one, but I really can't think of it. Um, yeah. So we've got Tranquility Lodge, right? It was chartered by the Grand Lodge of Texas. Um their official statement is Tranquility Lodge 2000 was chartered by the Grand Lodge of Texas for the purpose of promoting, encouraging, conducting, and fostering the principles of Freemasonry and to assist in promoting the health, welfare, education, and patriotism of children worthwhile. And so uh, the Grand on Lodge. The moon. Yes, and it's on the moon. Um, <laughs> so for anybody that did not know this, the moon is under the grand jurisdiction of the most worshipful Grand Lodge. Of Texas, ancient, free, and accepted masons. You got it. That? So when we colonize the moon and they put a lodge up there, it's it'll ours. be under the Grand Lodge of Texas. Yes. And so we had our first, you know, the Grand Lodge of Texas, uh, we had uh, the first member of any Grand Lodge was ours, uh, our member, B Brother Buzz Aldrin, in 1969. And so he brought with him uh, an American flag and also a flag representing the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite. Um, mm, and cool. so um, I don't know if he chartered anything for them there, but it wouldn't surprise me. So maybe the moon is also under the Scottish Rite southern jurisdiction's authority, but I don't know. Um, but the Grand Lodge of Texas gave uh, Brother Aldrin a dispensation to charter a moon on the lodge officially. So that's ours. <laughs> So, a little bit ridiculous, but uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, Tranquility yeah. Lodge's official statement is, Tranquility Lodge 2000 is based in Texas under the auspices of the Grand Lodge of Texas until such time as the lodge may hold its meetings under, uh, on the moon. And so they, they move from city to city, and the main meeting is held in Waco each July. But uh, I just thought that was kind of cool. So, uh, yeah, I, I really like it. And their, their big thing is, is supporting um, space-related education and space-related initiatives. Um, their apron, which, you know, finally getting to the apron itself, um, their apron is a white apron with a blue border. It's got the square and compasses and G on the bib. It's got tassels hanging down under the bib, like you might see on a UGLE apron. 
and it's got the emblem on the apron, and the a- uh, the apron emblem is uh, the Earth rise. So you're on the moon, and the instead of moon rise, you see the Earth rise, and so the Earth rise is coming up from behind the horizon of the moon. And it's got the outline of Texas and a superimposed square and compasses and G on top of the emblem itself. Uh, so the, the the Earth rise is acting as the background, and it's a really very pretty visual. I was going to say anybody can be a member of that law. That's true. If it's a cool thing a ma- to contribute to. If you are a master mason in the state of Texas, you can become a member of Tranquility Lodge. And I think you may not even have to be a master mason in Texas. You may just have to be a master mason. Yeah, no, that's the truth. As long as your jurisdiction allows it. Yeah. So, jo- um, it's just join the moon lodge. Kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other Texas, uh, lodge that has this different apron style is a, the Texas lodge of research. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there's a rule for it. Um, when you join the Texas lodge of research, you petition them. And you just join. You are an affiliate member. You get the newsletter. You get to attend the meetings. um, But you are not a full member of the Lodge. In order to wear the Texas Lodge of Research apron, you have to become a full member. And that is by getting your paper published in their annual transactions. So you have to send in a paper, and then you have to present the paper at the Texas Lodge of Research. And then they'll publish it in the... um, uh, tra- annual transactions. So it's it's really cool. It, if you see somebody wearing the TLR apron, it means that they've put in a lot of hard work um, for the purpose of education. So it, it's honestly kind of an honor. It's really cool. And the way that you recognize one of those aprons is that it's a white apron with orange trim instead of blue trim. It's got an all-seeing eye on the bib, and it's got a five-pointed star on the apron, and it's got a giant, in giant letters... G L R T, and that stands for Grand Lodge of the Republic of Texas, and this is what our original Grand Officers would have worn. The Grand Masters of the Republic of Texas wore this apron, and so it's it's cool. You see that apron, and you know that this person has contributed to making masonry better in Texas. It's just kind of yeah. awesome. No, that's definitely one that's hats off to those guys because. You definitely got to earn that one because submitting a paper is step one because they put it through a rigorous editing process. I I talked to many members and nobody that they know of has ever been accepted on their first try. Yeah, you really got. You get sit, yeah, you get you get your paper sent back at least once or twice, if not more. Yeah, they they, yeah. they said that they one of the things that uh, Jill P. Life. I'm not sorry, Jill P. Life. Uh, um, that Texas Lodge of Research says about the papers is that they have never had an a uh, a paper that has been accepted on the first go. Yeah. So, and which is cool, they've earned it. It's good stuff. You're it's going to be published, so you want it to be perfect anyway. It's close to it. That's true. You can't you can't exactly send in like a hacky sort of a uh, sort of paper. not maintain the prestige they have. So they do a good job at it, but you can do it. I think we've got a a member of our lodge that's about to get inducted into it. So it's good stuff. For sure. That completes our apron decoration, right? There's no other aprons that can be decorated. Not that I know. Not and I and know. I recommend going to uh, Grand Lodge of Texas. They've got an awesome museum there to where you can see old aprons where they used to be able to decorate it. There's some cool ones in there. Uh, but wherever that stopped being appropriate, you know, I still have mixed feelings because I'd kind of like to see decorated aprons, but maybe people cool would take it too to far. See. Yeah, it's kind of cool to see in uh, the, the plain aprons. Because everybody's, you know, same on the level and everything like that. But it is also kind of cool to see the um, interesting new aprons that can come up when people decorate their own stuff. So the the way that I look at it is that neither one is really wrong. No, but I do like the uniformity. So I got no qualms either way. I love them. 
So the quote that I have for tonight is, it's an excerpt from the um, the apron presentation. I don't want to read the whole thing just because it is kind of special. And you can find the whole thing online because it's not a secret. But I prefer not to spoil the whole thing for people that are going to hear it eventually. Um, but this is a section from the apron presentation. Ah, cool. It may be that in the coming years, upon your brow shall rest the laurel leaves of victory. It may be that pendant from your breast may hang jewels fit to grace the diadem of some eastern potentate. I, more than these, for light added to coming light, may enable your ambitious feet to tread round after round of the ladder that leads to fame in our mystic order. And even the purple of our fraternity may rest upon your honored shoulders. But never again, from mortal hands, never again, until your enfranchised spirit shall have passed upward and inward through the pearly gates, can a greater honor be bestowed, or one more emblematical of purity and innocence, than that which has been conferred upon you tonight. And that's from the uh, Lightfoot's Manual of the Lodge. And it's just a fantastic piece. It is very... When you're delivering it at the end of the master's degree, it is very emotionally charged. It's wonderful. It goes into why our apron is so important and why we wear it the way we do. And it's uh, one of my favorite um, pieces to deliver in Lodge. Yeah, it's a good one. So, but that, guys, that... closing thoughts? Um, For me, I think that quote kind of sums it up, is realize that thing that you're putting around your waist is more than just something you got to have on to get in Lodge. I mean, it's there's a deep meaning why you wear that apron and, you know, contemplate on that, research it, but, you know, take your apron wearing to the next level, be proud of the apron you wear, be glad to be putting it on. So like I talked about earlier, if you just absolutely will not wear your apron you were presented with, buy you another one and wear that nice leather apron. You can smell it when you're sitting in lodge and watch how it takes you up another level. Because you start adding just little things like that along the way. Next thing you know, you're going to want to be wearing a suit. You know, you're going to want to be taking every piece to the next level to see what it adds to your Masonic. And I can promise you wear a nice, clean apron that you're proud to walk into Lodge with will change your attitude in Lodge. Even if you already have a good one. It'll add to it. So wear your aprons. Wear wear nice ones. And get your case. You'll love it. Yeah, it makes you feel fancy. It does. Absolutely. I mean, I hear all kinds of people say, when you now this apron we're giving you, you need to put it in the bottom of your sock drawer so it doesn't get any light, never sees the, <laughs> the hide light it, of day. Hide, hide it in an unused pizza box at the top of your closet, <laughs> never pull it out. <laughs> exactly. Which, I mean, like I said, if that's your bag, so mode it be, buy you another one and wear that bad boy. I think an apron case, too, is less than 30, 40 bucks. Uh, and you'll love toting that thing around. Just throw it in your trunk and leave it there. Be with you. Yep. How about you, Billy? All right. So I think about this this bumper sticker that I've seen around uh, that says real men wear aprons. And for me, that apron symbolizes, you know, it, it's a link to these great men that have worn it throughout history. Um, for them, it was something special. For me, it's something special to be associated with these men, right? I mean, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, even Napoleon, um, you know, going back through history, uh, it meant something to them. And I, I think that that means something to me in turn. So uh, the apron, you know, it's it's not just something that you should take lightly. You should be proud of it when you wear it. And you should look into the history, too, for, you know, Texas has a lot of symbolism that goes into the apron. Uh, but there's a lot of symbolism no matter what state you're in or what jurisdiction. Uh, so I, I think. Going into that, it's just like anything else in masonry in that it leads you to think more about 
uh, how much has really gone into the formation of the craft, right? Was it, and I always wonder, is this intentional or is this something that we've just pieced together over time and it's coincidental, but either way, it's very cool. Uh, and something as simple as that white sheet of leather uh, is a part of that, you know, that, that goes into the great mysteries that is masonry. Yeah, it, it's, it's tough. That, that connection across the decades and centuries, man. It's super, super cool. Absolutely. It's to charge you up like that. Give you some energy. Yeah. And the way that I look at things is that, you know, the way when we when Masons started wearing aprons, they were operative Masons and they wore these giant hideous smocks, right? Like super large brown aprons that covered their like and it's not just like a blacksmith's apron but apparently it was like a giant thing that went all the way to their wrists and everything like that just like basically the whole cow um because they were doing some pretty dirty work and so over time the aprons got smaller and eventually they ended up with these smaller brown aprons uh and our french brethren because of fashion started decorating these aprons and made them pretty and white and small and manageable and uh, aprons had round corners. And then they evolved to having square corners and decorations. And then they made their way over to the United States. And all of a sudden, we're talking square corners and no decorations and just plain white aprons. And then we move on to 16 by 16 aprons, as you might see in the Grand Lodge of Texas. But each time that the apron has changed, it's because we're better trying to represent philosophical ideas, esoteric ideas, divine ideas. Our hands have crafted this this emblem to better represent what we believe is kind of like a divine sort of thing on earth. And I think that's just really beautiful. It's a very tangible way um, that we're trying to honor our creator. Uh, by crafting things that are beautiful. So we went up from the functional but very ugly operative apron to what we have now, which even though in Texas is very simple and plain, you start looking into it and it's packed with symbolism, even though there's nothing painted on it. It's just amazing to me. So, uh, you know, wear your aprons, folks. Go to Lodge. Enjoy the beauty behind that little square of leather. It's just a cool thing. I don't know. I like it. It's true that. All right. This is Rip Moore signing off. This is Billy Hamilton signing off. And this is Gabriel Yagish signing off.